Nike is one of the most famous and recognisable brands in the world. And alongside its logo, most of us also know the strapline, just do it. For them, that's obviously about encouraging us all to do more sport and exercise, and of course, wear their kit as we do. But it's also become my top tip in prayer, just do it. And I found that when I actually get down to prayer, it's much easier than I think. Because praying as Christians isn't about techniques or experience or getting it right, but relationship, talking to our Father in heaven. And Jesus' most famous teaching on prayer comes in the middle of the so-called Sermon on the Mount. It's one of two places where he taught the Lord's Prayer. And it starts with the words, when you pray. Jesus is assuming that we will just do it. The most important thing about prayer may be doing it in the first place, but thankfully Jesus doesn't leave it there, but continues with lots of helpful teaching and insight about how to do it. Interestingly, he starts with how not to pray. Do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Instead, we're told to pray in secret, in our room, focused on God. The point that Jesus is making is less how we do it. You can pray in your room, but not on a street corner. It's not that. But why? The people Jesus is criticising did it to impress others, and that's no good. Prayer is between me and God, you and God. So don't do it because you feel you have to, or because I told you, or to impress others. Pray because you have something to say to God. And actually, Jesus' encouragements to us to prioritise prayer are given not as a burden, but as a gift. I spoke to Esther, Adrian and Pip about how they pray, and a common theme was how much we get out of prayer. My happy, happy, happy moments and my happy, happy, my most peaceful time is sitting with Jesus, just him and me together and having a conversation with him. He always says, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here waiting for you. I'm just come and sit with me and be with me um, because I've been rushing around doing this, doing that, doing washing, fetching children, do all the things that you do, um, putting him absolutely to the bottom of the pile, forgetting, you know, sometimes um, if, I, if you just sit with Jesus, he'll sort it all out for you. It's not like a big, long prayer of da 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 and smells and bells. It's every day a little simple, like I'm talking to you now, Jesus is sitting there talking to, you know, we're chatting and having a lovely conversation together. When I don't do it, skid in the wrong direction, do a upside down, bolomakisi as we call it in South Africa, somersault of like, oh, and I'm not saying that doesn't happen when you do pray, because it, 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 it you know, it happens even when you pray. But I think the most important thing what, from my experience is that that Jesus is our friend, that he absolutely loves us and that he loves us sitting and being with him quietly. When we don't do that, I'm saying for me, when I don't do that, everything goes wrong. It does not only everything goes wrong, but you, at the end of the day you think, oh gosh, you know, I haven't really consciously asked the Lord for permission. Mm. It's, like, it's like life's out of kilter. Yes, yes, exactly. Pip's prayers are very uncomplicated and unselfconscious, and I think that's because she realises what it means to pray to God as Father. And as Jesus continues his teaching on prayer, that's where he turns next. He contrasts how we're supposed to pray with the pagans, who keep on babbling, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. It's actually an easy mistake to make thinking that God listens because we pray well. But Jesus tells us not to worry about that, saying, your father knows what you need before you ask him. It's an image I love because it reminds me of my relationship with my daughter. She's 18 months old and just learning words and short sentences. 
She almost never tells me something I don't know. But I just love being with her and talking with her. And she enjoys being with me. And when she asks me for things or needs a hug when she cries, I love to do it. Not because she asked well, but because I love her. And it's the same with us and God. He wants us to pray and answers our prayers and the rest of it, not because we're any good at it, but because he loves us. And actually, just like me and my daughter, he also wants to help us as we pray. One of Jesus' great promises of the Holy Spirit is at the end of the other passage where he teaches us the Lord's Prayer. Your Father in heaven will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. So the best way to grow in prayer is to ask God for help. And this all means that it's not about performance and there's no one right way to pray. There's a wonderful range and variety of prayers in the Bible. As many ways of praying in it as there are people. You can walk, sit, stand, kneel or dance, write your prayers down, act them out, whisper, shout, sing, speak normally or just keep silence. It's all there in the Bible. There are different types of prayers and you can do prayer in every way, shape or form. I think that sometimes and people think prayer has to be, you have to be in your room, you close the door and you don't go anywhere. You can go out. Sometimes I go out in the fields with the sheep and I just walk around and all the sheep are running because I'm praying loudly. And sometimes I'm like my poor neighbours because I live in a terrace house and they must be hearing this woman going, Hallelujah! Shon Merabasi! <laughs> you know, um, I'm like my poor neighbours, they're very good. And But I go out in the field and you can pray anywhere. And I think that you can pray quietly you can pray loudly you can pray any way you want but having a conversation with God that's the most important part for me of what prayer is there's lots of ways of praying and one way we can grow in our prayers is by trying out new ideas and learning from each other I've grown lots in prayer over the years as I've tried out things I've picked up from reading books or listening to sermons or just chatting to friends. Some things I try don't work so well for me and I just leave them there. But others really fly and I use them all the time, writing my prayers down like a letter or going for walks as I pray. I also love to pray with other people. The Bible is full of corporate prayer. It's one of the big things that we see the early church doing in the book of Acts. It's a great way to grow in prayer, particularly if this is all quite new to you. One of my top tips is to go to your church prayer meeting. They're always full of experienced and passionate prayers, and we can all learn so much from them as they pray. So I'd encourage you to explore and try things out in prayer. One reason I wanted to chat to Pip, Adrian and Esther was to pick things up from them. And I asked Adrian about a style of prayer I'm less familiar with, but knew he had experience of, contemplative prayer. So you don't just dive into silence or contemplation, but you walk slowly towards it. And there are a number of ways in which people do that. One of which would be what Benedictines call Lectio Divina, divine reading where you read a passage of scripture, you then choose a bit that hits you. I'm not going to explain it in, in any detail. And you stay with it, you chew over that. Out of that, you let prayer come. And at the end of the prayer, you stay in a place of contemplation, which is a place of wordless acceptance that God is here and I am here. And there is nothing more that we need to say, but Having spoken to you, God, I'll just sit with you for a while because it's a wonderful place to be. When we are with God, God indwells us. God, there, it isn't an emptiness or an absence. And all of the Christian mystics give us various images which are not about emptiness at all, they are about leaving behind stuff and junk and busyness so that you can focus on the one thing that is needful. So you don't go to zero, you go to one. Teresa of Avila in her autobiography speaks about prayer as being like water. 
So it's very, and, and there are different ways, she says, that water can be achieved. It can be achieved with hard work through um, mechanics, through pulling it up on a well, and then she goes all the way through to rain, which just falls. But it's always about the water, which is the life, the presence, the indwelling of God. So yes, it's about more, not less. One question people always ask is, when should I pray? And one answer is, all the time. Paul tells us to pray continually, which is a high bar. But in Matthew 6, Jesus seems to be talking about setting aside time to just pray. Go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father. He's not saying that we can only pray in our bedroom or that we can't pray with others, as we've seen. But he is telling us to spend some time, presumably each day, on our own in prayer. And that was certainly Jesus' own practice. And I found in my life that my personal prayer and time with God each day, reading the Bible as well, is the bedrock of my relationship with God and everything else. It can be any time, but even though I'm really not a morning person, I found that's the best time for it. There's something about starting the day off with God. As a pastor, I used to be quite shy about all this. My church was here in the city, London's financial district, and it's a world of long hours, hard work and no time. I wanted to encourage prayer, but also show grace to busy people. But I came to realise that while God will always show grace to us, even if we don't pray, we're the ones that miss out. Not praying may free up some time, but it also keeps us from God's presence and his help and peace, which is the one thing we need more than anything. I know you're probably busy, and carving out time to pray is hard, but it is vital, and you'll never regret it. At this point, though, people often ask, well, can't I just pray all the time? And the Bible does have lots of examples of what my mum calls arrow prayers, little prayers prayed in the midst of ordinary life. Nothing is too small for God and nothing is beyond God. So we can pray about everything. And yet somehow our little and continual prayers are built on those times that we spend alone with God. Jesus did and commanded both. Adrian put it beautifully when we talked. And I really like the beginning of the day with prayer. That's the thing that then makes everything else become in some extended way prayer in the course of the day. All of life is lived in the presence of God, whether or not we acknowledge God's presence. So everywhere is face to face with God so far as God is concerned. And so in every place I can turn towards God and I can do that formally in the morning in bed, using a psalm, using the scriptures. I can do it in activity either by inviting God into the mix, I'm thinking of baking bread here, or by attending to God in the activity that I'm doing, or by means of association. So I'm kneading and I'm aware of the presence of God and I might be talking to God and the physicality of it is also a way of being prayerful. So everything is not prayer but everything can have a prayerful dimension to it. The final part of this passage is the Lord's Prayer, and its focus is not on the techniques and practicalities of prayer, but its content. What are we supposed to pray for? And one answer is anything. If God is our Father, there's nothing we can't say to him. But Jesus clearly also wanted to guide and steer what we pray for. And the Lord's Prayer is like a map or model, helping us to find our way round in prayer. The simplest way to use it is just to pray the prayer itself, using Jesus' actual words, either corporately in a church or group, 
or as an easy way to pray on our own. But we needn't stop there. We can also use the Lord's Prayer as a launch pad to more prayer, using each line as a guide and inspiration to help us pray more along the same lines. The great reformer Martin Luther used to do this in his prayers, and Esther recommended it too. Invite the Holy Spirit and just say, Lord, I don't know how to pray the Lord's Prayer. It's the simplest. Open your Bible, get the Lord's Prayer, and every verse is a prayer point. Our Father who art in heaven, my Father in heaven, I bless you, I thank you for my day. I give you glory, thank you for my life, for my family. That's the first prayer point, my Father in heaven. Um, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Praise his name, I praise your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Lord, I pray for your kingdom to come, your will be done on this earth. Lord, I ask that you bless me, that you, sh you give me the tools that I know that I have. Encourage me to change this world for your glory. You begin to break all of the verses down by prayer points and you begin to find you've just spent half an hour praying the Lord's Prayer out of nothing. So we have a, a it tool and everything, a helper. A tool and a helper, so absolutely. That, yeah. We, it's we, all there. We've got what we need to pray for. Absolutely. And then the Holy Spirit comes yeah. alongside. And yes. Makes it your easy. kingdom come, your will be done on earth. Give us this day our daily bread. You pray for yourself, Lord, give me what I need today. Because he says, the birds of the air, they don't, you know, but they get everything they need. How much more? My children, the ones that I love, made in my image and likeness, you know, the ones I love, you know, give me my daily bread, Lord. I ask that you provide for me everything because it tells us not to worry. So that's where you pray for yourself, you pray for provision. So you break it all down by prayer point by prayer point and you just take it one at a time. There's no rush. And just pray what evil comes in your heart. And then you begin to develop your prayer life. Both Esther and Luther highlight how the Holy Spirit so often speaks to us when we pray in this way. Luther calls it the Holy Spirit preaching and encourages us to make room for such thoughts where one word is better than a thousand. It's easy to leave no space in our prayers for God to speak to us. But however we pray, it's always worth listening for the whispers of God. And using biblical prayers like the Lord's Prayer or a Psalm or one of Paul's prayers can be one way of doing that and listening for God to speak to us. One final way to use the Lord's Prayer is as a guide to the main themes and types of prayer more generally. It starts with worship, as we declare who God is and pray for his name to be glorified. Then moves on to intercession, asking for things, as we pray first for the things of God, for his plans and purposes to be worked out, and then for our own wants and needs. We then come to confession, recognising our failings, repenting of them and asking God for forgiveness. Before returning to intercession at the end, this time in spiritual warfare, as we ask for protection against evil and temptation. And those themes, worship, intercession, confession, are prayer themes we find everywhere in the Bible. But the Lord's Prayer isn't exhaustive, and there are other types of prayer found elsewhere in Scripture. The biggest is probably thanksgiving, which is also a vital part of our prayer lives. And that gives us four main categories as a basis for our prayer. Worship, confession, intercession and thanksgiving. Or, wow, sorry, help and thank you. As we finish, can I pray for you and your prayer life? Father God, thank you for everyone watching. Come by your Holy Spirit and meet with them now. Help them to pray more and deeper. Come Holy Spirit. Amen.